All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, 19th online Spintronics seminar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is Xin Fan from University of Denver. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Satoru Emery is a system professor in the Department of Physics at Virginia Tech. He received his uh, uh, BS degree in material science and engineering at the University of California, Irvine in 2008 and a PhD in material science and engineering at MIT in 2013. His doctor, doctoral thesis work investigated the motion of chiral domain walls in ultra-thin metallic ferromagnets. Following his postdoc work at Northeastern University and Stanford University, where he studied magnetization dynamics in complex oxide materials, he joined the faculty of Virginia Tech in fall 2017. His current research program focuses on swing transport and dynamics in model thin film materials, ranging from amorphous metals to epitaxial oxides. So without further ado, Dr. Emery, please go ahead with your talk. All right, uh, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both Shen and Kirill for organizing this wonderful online Spentronic seminar series. And today I'm very excited to have this opportunity to present this work to you all uh, through this very nice uh, open online format. Now, before I get started, what, what I'd like to do is uh, acknowledge uh, all these people from my lab, uh, in particular, Yang Min Lim, uh, the graduate student who has done uh, most of the experimental work that I'm about to show you today, uh, along with Berus Kudadadi, uh, my former postdoc who is now at Intel in Oregon, and uh, he really helped us get started with uh, a lot of the experimental efforts that are going on currently in my group. I would also like to acknowledge our collaborators for this particular study, uh, Dwight Vilan and Ji Fang Li, uh, both from uh, material science at Virginia Tech, uh, as well as Aurelian Manchuan, uh, who has helped tremendously uh, in figuring out the sensible way to uh, model our experimental results. Now, before I get on with my own talk, uh, I would like to uh, do a bit of advertisement for the upcoming Spintronic seminar talk, uh, which will be given by my cl close collaborator, uh, Tim Mevis from the University of Alabama. Uh, so he's going to be talking about a series of uh, very nice studies um, on uh, magnetization dynamics and damping. And, but uh, one, one small part of what he's going to talk about uh, is this collaborative effort uh, in which we have, a, we have discovered a rather interesting intrinsic mechanism for Gilbert damping uh, in, um, in the prototypical ferromagnetic metal of epitaxial iron. Okay, so uh, if you have time this coming Friday, yeah, I would highly encourage you all to uh, come check out this talk by Tim. Okay, now onwards with my presentation. Um, so our study is uh, essentially motivated by this rather fundamental question regarding how far a spin current can remain coherent or propagate in metals with antiferromagnetic order. Now, stepping back a little bit, uh, what's already quite well known uh, is that when you have a spin current like this, uh, which is polarized transverse to the um, magnetic order in a ferromagnet, that transfer spin current can only propagate um, over a short distance of about one nanometer. And uh, this is limited, this le short length scale is really limited by this effect called dephasing, which I will talk about throughout this presentation. Now, what is not quite well known uh, is how long such a transfer spin current can remain coherent in metals with antiferromagnetic order. So these materials include, for instance, ferrimagnetic alloys with um, uh, two magnetic sublattices that are antiferromagnetically coupled to each other. Now, from our experiments, what we find is that uh, uh, transfer spin current in metals with antiferromagnetic order can need, need indeed travel over a longer distance. So up to, in our experiments, actually up to a, about a factor of five greater than what we find in uh, pure ferromagnets. Um, and uh, so this, this extended um, uh, dephasing length occurs due to the suppression of dephasing. So without going into a whole lot of details at this point, the way this works roughly is that when the transfer spin current um, interacts with the, um, the first magnetic sublattice here, uh, it undergoes some amount of dephasing or scrambling, if you will, 
but that scrambling actually gets undone or canceled as the spin current interacts with this other magnetic sublattice. Uh, in essence, the physics that we're demonstrating here is quite a bit analogous to um, the so-called spin echo or spin rephasing technique that's commonly used in um, nuclear magnetic resonance and more recently in mitigating decoherence in qubit systems. Now, while the scope of our work is quite fundamental, um, I would say that there is uh, an actual connection to practical applications, practical spintronic applications, um, in the sense that spin torque effects fundamentally arise from uh, this dephasing effect. Or so to, to put it in um, a different way, this dephasing length exactly is exactly the length scale uh, within which spin torque effects take place in um, metals with um, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic order, uh, which might be used for some kind of practical spintronic devices. Okay, so with that, here's a quick outline of what I'm gonna be talking about for the next, uh, I think, 40 minutes or so. Uh, what I'd like to do first is provide you with a bit of background information about how a spin current uh, undergoes decoherence, and also a little bit about why we have opted to use uh, ferromagnetic alloys of cobalt gadolinium as the model system for our experiments. Um, I will then, of course, talk about our experimental results uh, in which we measure the length scale associated with spin dephasing um, in a series of cobalt gadolinium alloys. And finally, I'll conclude my talk by talking about um, um, the uh, model that we use in order to quantify the dephasing length while capturing the relevant physics. So let's get on with our uh, background uh, introduction. Uh, in our study, the experimental technique that we use is ferromagnetic resonance or FMR spin pumping, and we use it to uh, generate a spin current uh, in this kind of multi-layered structure. So on one side, we have a ferromagnetic spin source, uh, which is excited by a microwave to drive the magnetization into precession, into ferromagnetic resonance. Uh, when the spin source exhibits FMR, what comes out of it, is a spin current, which is more or less polarized transverse to the precessional axis in, this, in, in the uh, spin source material. Um, so let's see, so the spin current, uh, so this is a pure spin current that's actually not accompanied by a net motion of electronic charge, uh, but still the spin current itself is, um, is actually carried by electrons. Uh, in this case, um, in this non-magnetic metal spacer layer of copper. Um, furthermore, this pure spin current is a coherent spin current in the sense that its polarization is locked in phase with the uh, precessional phase of the FMR dynamics here. Uh, and when this spin current is propagating through the spacer, uh, in our case copper, um, there's not much that can really disturb the coherence, the mutual alignment of these spins um, in the spin current. However, in general, what can happen is when the spin current enters a spin sink material, uh, there can indeed be something that can disturb the coherence of the spin current, such that uh, after the current propagates um, over a certain distance within the spin sink, uh, we lose the mutual kind of synchronization or coherence of the spins. So this loss of coherence is what we mean by all well, the decoherence of spin current. So let's take a quick look at what can actually cause uh, uh, spin decoherence, decoherence of the uh, pure spin current, transfer spin current. Um, so one possibility is spin flip scattering, which can arise due to something intrinsic to the spin sink material like spin orbit coupling. So what happens is every time an electron that's carrying um, uh, spin gets scattered, the polarization, the spin polarization of that carrier uh, can also be altered such that um, you know, with enough of these scattering events, uh, we end up with a random, a collection of randomized spin polarization here. Now there's another possibility if the spin sink material contains um, some magnetic order in it. Um, and this mechanism here is spin dephasing, which really arises due to the interaction of spin current with the exchange field in the spin sink. And again, what we have here is a, uh, an incident coherent spin current that's polarized uh, transverse to the magnetic order, to the magnetization or exchange field in the spin sink. Uh, 
Now in this case, what can happen is that the spin polarization um, can rotate by some amount as it interacts with this um, magnetic order, but the amount or the rate at which the spins rotate, uh, uh, process, uh, would actually depend on the wave vector um, of, um, of that spin current. So in particular, this part of this, uh, the part of th this part of the spin current, which is kind of going diagonal in this picture, would undergo uh, uh, a larger amount of precession than this part of the spin current that's more or less traveling straight through the spin sink. So as you can imagine, as the spin sink goes farther and farther into the uh, uh, spin sink, uh, we get more and more deviation among the spins that are propagating through. Uh, until we might get something like this, where if we were to take the, uh, the vector sum of all the spins, the transverse spins that have propagated, uh, well, we end up with a vector sum of zero. So this is to say that this spin defacing effect is really an averaging effect where the, uh, the net transverse spin component uh, is getting averaged out. So we're converging to a vector sum of zero due to all these spins processing at different rates depending on their wave vector or propagation direction. Okay, uh, so what we have seen so far is that in spin sinks uh, that have magnetic order, we have two major types of, uh, two major mechanisms um, through which spin decoherence can happen. Uh, first is spin flip scattering. And uh, it turns out that in many ferromagnetic metals, uh, for instance, um, cobalt in this case, the length scale associated with the spin, sp spin sp flip scattering uh, can be relatively long. Uh, so it's found that for um, pure cobalt, for instance, it could be close to say 10 nanometers or so. Now, on the other hand, we have this other mechanism, spin defacing, that comes from the averaging effect, uh, where the characteristic length scale, the spin defacing length, um, is usually quite short in ferromagnetic metals, so something like one nanometer. Now, in other words, in most ferromagnetic metals, uh, it's actually quite safe to say that um, the decoherence process of um, uh, transverse spin current is really dominated by the spin defacing process. Um, in other words, uh, the coherence length for uh, the transfer spin current is really limited by the spin defacing length, really short spin defacing length of only one nanometer. So the story so far is that in, um, in ferromagnetic metals, um, the, uh, transfer spin co the coherent transfer spin current can propagate for only a short distance before losing coherence. Um, but what's the story with antiferromagnetic metals? Now, for the sake of um, simplifying the explanation here, what I show is a, a, a rather idealized and very simplistic antiferromagnetic spin sink where the magnetic order is, um, is perfectly collinear and, and arranged in this kind of uh, alternating layer by layer fashion. Um, and again, what we have here is a, an incident spin current that's polarized transverse with respect to the magnetic order. So just like in the case of the ferro magnet, um, this transfer spin current does undergo some amount of dephasing as it interacts with this first magnetic sublattice. Uh, but when it interacts with this other magnetic sublattice that's pointed in the opposite direction, uh, we get spin precession um, in, in the opposite direction. So this actually means that in this kind of very much idealized collinear layer by layer anti ferro magnet, um, the phasing of this transfer spin current is completely canceled um, as, it, as the spin current makes its way through the spin sink. So just to repeat, kind of repeat what I said, uh, you can have a bit of a spin dephasing uh, through the interaction, through interaction with this um, uh, one magnetic sublattice, but that dephasing actually gets undone uh, by interacting with, uh, with the other magnetic sublattice. Now, according to the simplistic picture, it might seem as if um, our transfer spin current can propagate just forever and ever without ever really decohering or defacing. So it might seem as if uh, we end up with an infinite coherence length for uh, transfer spin current in an antiferromagnetic spin sink. Uh, but of course, this is kind of ridiculous. Uh, in, uh, in real antiferromagnetic metals, the coherence length is found to be uh, finite. Um, and in many of these commonly used antiferromagnets, it's quite short. 
And uh, this comes from the fact that, well, we have made some uh, pretty unrealistic assumptions. So in real antiferrol magnets, the magnetic order um, uh, in the antiferrol magnet can be quite complex. So you can have some non-collinear magnetic order, and it's not even guaranteed to be in a, in a um, uh, uniform, uh, uniform magnetic state. Uh, so you can have, in general, uh, a multi-domain configuration. And another thing is that in the simplistic picture, uh, we have assumed that there is no scattering whatsoever, uh, scattering in either spin or, or momentum. But of course, in real materials, we always have some amount of scattering, so spin-orbit coupling, which might lead to some uh, spin-flip scattering. Now, uh, of course, by looking at the literature, uh, what we find is that um, uh, for these commonly used ferromagnetic metals, uh, anti-ferromagnetic metals, uh, the spin coherence lengths are typically quite short, uh, even you know, on the order of one to two nanometers, so not much different from the coherence length or the dephasing length in ferro magnets. And another thing that's kind of interesting is that these co this uh, coherence length uh, is more or less inversely proportional to um, uh, resistivity, so that implies that whenever there is more electronic scattering, um, we, get, uh, we get shorter coherence. So this kind of um, uh, collection of this experimental results would suggest that what's limiting the coherence length of um, spin currents in antiferromagnetic metals is not this kind of dephasing based picture, but rather uh, this kind of picture where um, uh, decoherence is dominated by uh, some kind of scattering mechanism. Now, at this point, it's interesting to ask, ask this question um, whether there are any antiferromagnetic metals or something even resembling antiferromagnetic metals where we can um, test for this hypothesis that you know, antiferromagnetic um, order can extend the, uh, the dephasing length um, of the transverse spin current. Where, in other words, we're looking for material where this dephasing mechanism uh, may dominate or antiferromagnetic like material where this dephasing mechanism may dominate or this uh, scattering based mechanism. So this is where our choice of ferrimagnetic alloys comes in. Uh, so again, in, uh, in actual, you know, real intrinsic antiferromagnets, uh, it's again notoriously challenging to achieve simple uh, collinear and uh, uniform magnetic state. Uh, whereas in ferry magnets, uh, because of this uh, s generally small and yet finite net magnetization, uh, it's actually quite straightforward for us to achieve um, nice collinear um, uniformly magnetized state simply by applying a moderate amount of magnetic field. Another advantage of using ferry magnetic alloys is that um, the magnetic order itself is quite tunable uh, by adjusting the composition, or more specifically, the relative ratio of these two elements, transition, some kind of transition metal and uh, some kind of rare earth metal, um, which make up the two antiferromagnetically coupled sublattices. So if we carefully tune the composition of uh, a ferromagnetic alloy, uh, it's possible for us to get arbitrarily close to this so-called magnetically compensated, uh, magnetic compensation point uh, where the two magnetic sublattices more or less cancel each other out. So we, we would expect to see some dynamics and spin transport effects um, that, uh, that essentially mimic um, those of antiferromagnets. Um, indeed, motivated by uh, you know, this kind of picture, the advantages of ferrimagnetic alloys, uh, indeed, there has been a recent uh, rather high profile study published in Nature Materials uh, that has used ferrimagnetic alloys, in this case cobalt terbium, to um, test the hypothesis of the longer spin coherence length that's enabled by antiferromagnetic order. Now, in essence, this study measures the transmission of um, um, coherent spin current uh, through this ferromagnetic cobalt, uh, cobalt terbium layer by detecting what is presumably um, the inverse spin hole voltage across the platinum detector. And since a finite voltage was detected um, through this kind of measurement, even when there is a, a rather thick layer of cobalt terbium, so even 10 to 12 nanometers. Um, so the fact that this kind of voltage was detected even in the presence of 10 to 12 nanometers of cobalt uh, 
uh, was used as evidence to conclude that the spin coherence length in cobalt terbium must be longer than 10 nanometers. Now, this is a rather exciting and uh, intriguing study. Uh, although, I guess upon closer inspection, uh, there are some questions that um, I think still remain open. Um, first of all, the first one is kind of a technical question, um, so, which is, you know, this voltage that's being measured here, uh, what, is it, what is it really capturing? Um, or in other words, is it really okay to attribute this voltage entirely to um, uh, spin transport that's occurring um, through cobalt terbium and ultimately this, um, uh, some kind of uh, spin to charge conversion in the platinum detector? Uh, now, the second, the second question is more uh, fundamental, um, which is that, which is, um, you know, how or even whether a transfer spin coherent or transfer spin current can even remain coherent in cobalt terbium, uh, which is a pretty famous material for having very strong spin orbit coupling, presumably leading to strong spin flip scattering and uh, non-collinear magnetic order, etc. Now, to this end, what we have decided to do is to use a, an alternative ferrimagnetic system for our experiments, and what we have chosen is cobalt gadolinium. Just like cobalt terbium, uh, cobalt gadolinium is an amorphous ferrimagnetic alloy, so it's still structurally disordered. Um, but unlike cobalt terbium, which has very strong spin orbit coupling due to the presence of terbium uh, with a giant um, um, orbital angular momentum, Terbium. Uh, the spin orbit coupling of cobalt gadolinium is expected to be much weaker uh, thanks to the nominally zero orbital angular momentum of gadolinium. So this should mean that within cobalt gadolinium, uh, uh, spin flip scattering or spin orbit uh, spin flip scattering uh, should be comparatively weak. And furthermore, because of this weaker spin orbit coupling, uh, we would also expect the um, uh, the uh, mutual alignment of these magnetic sublattices to be essentially collinear, whereas in cobalt terbium, due to the strong spin orbit coupling, it's actually known that the, uh, the cobalt and terbium sublattices are not quite aligned collinear. So in general, they, they have some kind of more complicated non-collinear order. So in a nutshell, we believe cobalt gadolinium to be an excellent model system uh, with which we can test for this hypothesis uh, for the longer coherence or dephasing length um, um, that's enabled by uh, anti ferromagnetic order. Okay, so this was kind of a, a long background introduction section, but here's the story so far. Um, what we have seen from the literature is that in real anti ferromagnets, anti ferromagnetic metals, the uh, expected uh, longer spin coherence length is, uh, is really not observed. Uh, presumably because of some uh, complicated non-ideal magnetic order or the prevalence of um, uh, scattering, the dominance of uh, uh, some scattering mechanism. So our hypothesis here going forward is that uh, we should be able to achieve a longer spin dephasing length in, um, in compensated ferrimagnetic uh, cobalt gadolinium alloys, uh, where it's more straightforward for us to achieve uniform um, collinear anti magnetic order, um, um, as well as weaker, comparatively weaker spin orbit coupling. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to talk about now is our actual experimental results uh, in which we attempt to measure the length scale of spin dephasing in cobalt gadolinium. So here's a quick uh, rundown of how we carry out our experiments. Um, so this is essentially um, a fairly standard broadband ferromagnetic resonance um, in which we place our thin film sample uh, film side down on the coplanar waveguide. And we magnetize our sample within the film plane by using an in-plane quasi-static bias magnetic field. And here's a cartoon of what our thin film stack structure looks like. Uh, it may seem a bit complicated, but the important parts really are the um, permaloid spin source and the cobalt or cobalt gadolinium spin sink. And those two layers are separated or magnetically decoupled um, by uh, four nanometers of um, copper spacer here. Now we turn on the microwave excitation and uh, when we hit our resonance condition, the magnetization starts to process. Uh, 
which of course allows us to um, inject a coherent spin current into our spin sink layer. Now, what we measure is something that might look like this, um, our fMR spectrum. The quantity that we're particularly interested in is the line width, and that's related to the damping that's experienced by the, um, uh, the magnetization in the spin source layer. In particular, we measure um, our line width uh, as a function of frequency, and uh, from the, by linearly fitting the frequency dependence of uh, line width, with doing a linear fit, we, uh, we extract the so-called Gilbert damping parameter. Okay. Now, in this kind of sample, uh, where we do not have a spin sink layer that can absorb a spin current, uh, what's happening here is that uh, uh, the spin source layer pumps a spin current out, but since it's not absorbed, it just backflows in into the spin source. And consequently, what we observe is a Gilbert damping parameter of about 0.067. So that's, that's the Gilbert damping parameter, the intrinsic Gilbert damping parameter of, um, of uh, the spin source material, so permalloy. But uh, when we include a, uh, even a little bit of um, uh, ma magnetically ordered spin sink, say one nanometer of cobalt, ferromagnetic cobalt in this case, we observe a significant increase in damping, in this case above by 20%. And uh, this is consistent with a scenario um, uh, where the uh, permalloy spin source is losing some amount of spin angular momentum as some of the outflowing spin current is being absorbed or is undergoing dephasing um, in the cobalt spin sink layer. Uh, so in other words, we can use this enhancement of Gilbert damping delta alpha um, as a measure of how much um, uh, spin current is being absorbed or is dephasing um, in the magnetic spin sink material. Now we can also check whether this enhanced damping is really due to the spin current um, uh, reaching all the way um, into this ferromagnetic spin sink uh, simply by measuring uh, another control stack structure where we have an insulating titanium oxide layer that completely blocks the spin current. Now, indeed, with this kind of spin blocker layer, uh, we don't observe um, any damping en enhancement. Uh, so this essentially verifies that delta alpha uh, indeed is due to um, the, uh, the absorption or dephasing of transfer spin current um, in this magnetic spin sink layer. Of course, we can carry out this type of experiments for um, um, a whole series of samples with different cobalt thicknesses, and this is what we find. We find that the damping increases quite sharply uh, with increasing cobalt spin sink thickness up to about one nanometer, uh, and then it saturates. Now, this observation is very much consistent with the known fact that um, all the dephasing of the transfer spin current takes place within the first one nanometer of cobalt uh, near the interface here. Now, this is something that's been uh, actually well known for um, over, uh, over a decade, but what is new in our experimental study is that um, uh, we have conducted a series of spin pumping measurements in ferrimagnetic spin sinks um, and also with different compositions. So what I'm going to show you on this slide um, are some representative results uh, of samples with uh, cobalt gadolinium spin sinks that are very close to being magnetically compensated, such that the gadolinium, magnet gadolinium magnetic sublattice and the cobalt sublattice uh, nearly compensate each other. Okay, so when we add, say, about one and a half nanometer of this cobalt gadolinium, we still do see some enhancement of Gilbert damping but it's quite small, much, much smaller than what we have observed previously for the pure cobalt spin sink sample. We then increase our cobalt gadolinium um, thickness, about two and a half nanometers. We see uh, a bit more increase in um, uh, Gilbert damping. And finally, by increasing the cobalt gadolinium spin sink, spin sink thickness to say several nanometers, um, we do get a damping enhancement that is quite close to what we have observed previously um, for ferromagnetic cobalt. So the overall story here is that the damping enhancement um, is much more gradual 
um, uh, with the increase of ferrimagnetic cobalt um, spensing thickness than what we saw for the ferromagnetic spensing case. Okay, so here's a quick summary of um, how the damping enhancement evolves with increasing cobalt gadolinium spensing thickness. And again, this is more of a, a gradual trend, but we do reach saturation. But what's important here is that the thickness at which we observe saturation um, is definitely much greater than one nanometer. So this appears to be um, a pretty good experimental indication that uh, the length scale for spin defacing, the spin defacing length, um, should also be much greater than one nanometer in this type of uh, compensated ferrimagnetic material. Um, we have conducted this type of experiment um, uh, for a whole variety of samples, or a whole variety of cobalt gadolinium uh, spin sink compositions on both sides of uh, magnetic compensation, so cobalt dominated and gadolinium dominated. And again, what we observe is a, um, essentially a saturating effect. Um, but again, the important thing is that the, um, the apparent spin defacing length or really the, um, the uh, spin sink thickness at which the damping enhancement appears to saturate uh, is maximized or if you believe this sort of guy for the eye, that is, it appears to be maximized um, when the cobalt gadolinium spin sink is close to being compensated. But what I would like to point out here is that um, what's being uh, suggested here, these uh, shaded um, things, are really just guides for the eye. So in other words, what's lacking here is a is an actual model that quantifies the uh, defacing length in a physically meaningful way. Okay, oh, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the main message. So it looks like we're, we're, we're seeing an extension of um, the spin defacing length um, associated with magnetic compensation, but the question is how do we quantify? Um, another kind of odd thing is that if you look at some of our experimental data carefully, we're seeing some pretty interesting uh, non-monotonic trends, where for instance, the damping enhancement shoots up, comes back down, and then goes back up again to saturation. Uh, here's more of a more subtle gradual trend, uh, where again, it shoots up more gradually, and then it, it does appear to saturate, but there is a bit of a, a downward slope here, which looks kind of strange. Um, and, and indeed, uh, we carried out um, additional experiments on additional cobalt gadolinium uh, compositions, and this is what we end up with. And again, what, we're, uh, what we really need here is a, um, is a quantitative model that can capture, that can reproduce all, all of these experimental data in some sort of consistent way. And um, well, at this point, what might be, you know, we might be tempted to use a, um, a conventional drift diffusion model that's very widely used, particularly for non-magnetic metal spin sinks, uh, using uh, very well-known parameters like, uh, like the spin mixing conductance and spin diffusion length. Um, and by applying this kind of model, we expect to get, uh, in general, this um, uh, monotonic increase in uh, damping enhancement and then saturation with increasing uh, spin sink thickness. So while this sort of trend can kind of, kind of qualitatively reproduce um, the overall trend that we're seeing here experimentally, um, it, it definitely is unable to uh, reproduce some of these weird overshooting features. And of course, uh, maybe a more obvious thing is that what's being modeled here is a non-magnetic non metal spin sink so that all the spin decoherence is, um, you know, is coming from spin flip scattering. There is no interaction with um, any magnetic order here because there is none. Um, so there's no, there's no defacing here in this model. Uh, furthermore, it's also true that there have been quite a few studies where, uh, or spin pumping studies uh, that, um, that employed uh, magnetically ordered or ferromagnetic metal spin sinks but in most of these, what's typically done is that uh, the spin defacing length is actually really set to zero. So all of the spin decoherence is assumed to happen by means of uh, very abrupt defacing right at the ferromagnetic interface. 
Now with this kind of model, what we observe, what we would get is just a, a instant, basically an instantaneous increase in, um, uh, in damping, uh, even after adding just a little bit of uh, some finite amount of uh, magnetic spin sink. Okay, um, so here's a kind of a quick summary of what we have found experimentally and what we need going forward. Um, so from this trend of damping enhancement plotted against the cobalt gadolinium spin sink thickness, um, what's actually being suggested is that uh, there is indeed a longer spin dephasing length um, that seems to arise near the compensation composition of cobalt gadolinium. But what we need here is an alternative um, uh, model, some sort of modified drift diffusion model to capture the, the internal physics of dephasing uh, in these cobalt gadolinium spin sinks. So with that, uh, this is actually what I'm going to talk about, um, how to really model and uh, get us um, um, uh, dephasing length in a meaningful a physically meaningful way. Okay, so here's a quick illustration of, again, the type of um, uh, structure that we're looking at. So we have a, a source of coherent spin current um, traveling through, subsequently traveling through this copper spacer. And some of this incident spin current is being reflected um, at this interface with a spin sink. And uh, the amount of reflection that takes place or uh, reflection that takes place is, um, uh, captured by this very well-known parameter, uh, uh, spin mixing conductance. Uh, in our case, we call this, we call this the um, reflected spin mixing conductance. What is special about our study though, is that we have a finite amount of transmitted spin current that's propagating through the spin sink material. And furthermore, there's uh, something happening within the spin sink, uh, which is uh, dephasing. So the transmitted transfer spin current is undergoing dephasing. So more specifically, what's happening is that the, uh, the net transfer spin that's carried by the spin current is rotating uh, about the effective magnetization axis with a net magnetization direction. And furthermore, because of the averaging effect, the dephasing effect, the, um, the magnitude of the, uh, the, the uh, transfer spin component is, uh, is decreasing as the spin current goes farther and farther into the spin sink. So the uh, parameter that can capture this kind of physics um, is what is called a transmitted spin mixing conductance. And uh, the uh, concept of the transmitted mi spin mixing conductance is, is actually not, um, it's not entirely novel. In fact, it's been around for, um, for almost two decades. Um, but at the same time, uh, this is a concept that really hasn't been used a whole lot in, in, um, in uh, both experimental and theoretical studies. Uh, in fact, the five references that I list up here probably, um, uh, probably capture almost all of the uh, studies that even mention the concept of transmitted spin mixing conductance. Now, in any case, this transmitted spin mixing conductance is essentially a function of, a, um, of the uh, spin sink thickness. So it varies with um, the thickness of the spin sink. And furthermore, it is a complex function. It has a real part and an imaginary part. So physically, the real part of the transmitted spin mixing conductance uh, represents um, what I call the X component the spin that's being transmitted. So that's the component that's, um, uh, that's along, uh, that's parallel to the incident spin polarization. And of course, we have the imaginary part, um, which is proportional to what I call the Y component of the transmitted spins. Um, and what's important to keep in mind is that for the transmitted spin mixing conductance, the imaginary part uh, in general is comparable um, in magnitude um, to the real part. Um, unlike what we typically find for the reflected spin mixing conductance where the real part is usually much, much larger than the, the uh, imaginary part. So in essence, uh, we have introduced this new quantity, or I, su I should say function, um, uh, uh, transmitted spin mixing conductance. And uh, this, is, this is really the ingredient that reproduces the physics of spin dephasing and the spin sink. So this captures um, the simultaneous precession, 
and decay of the transfer spin component as it travels through the spin sink. Okay, so here's what, uh, you know, what this uh, transmitted spin mixing conductance may look like as a function of um, uh, spin sink thickness. So it's an oscillatory decaying function. And, um, and here's the, where the oscillating part, again, physically represents um, rotation or precession and the gain part represents the, uh, the averaging effect, the dephasing. Okay, so here's what the real part may look like. And here's the imaginary part representing the orthogonal um, uh, spin polarization component. Okay, so in effect, what we have here is a modified drift diffusion model uh, that includes this new ingredient of dephasing. So we have the spin dephasing length and the transmitted spin mixing conductance. Um, and uh, and uh, the details of this model were actually the, uh, the details of the model or how we apply this model, boundary conditions, et cetera, have actually been worked out um, over 12 years ago by this paper by uh, Taniguchi-san. So this is, um, this is essentially what we use. Um, <clears throat> Now, at a first glance, though, this model may seem a, a bit cumbersome or intimidating. Uh, it looks like there are quite a few parameters um, and uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, free what what might what what might be taken as free parameters. But based on reasons that I'm not going to get into um, in the interest of time, it's actually possible for us by you know um, by going with certain assumptions to reduce the number of free parameters in our fitting uh, to just two. So we just have these two free parameters. So again, the first one is the spin dephasing length, which physically represents, roughly speaking, how far uh, these transfer spins can propagate before uh, completely being defaced. And uh, we also have the uh, coefficient that defines kind of the magnitude of the imaginary part of the transmitted spin mixing conductance. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful, but uh, what this parameter really represents is um, the amplitude um, of um, precession that this transfer spin current um, undergoes as it travels through the um, uh, magnetically ordered spin sink. So the bottom line is that we uh, we essentially have just two free fit parameter, uh, two free uh, fitting parameters uh, in our modeling. So let's now see how this model um, does in fitting all of our uh, experimental data for you know, several cobalt gadolinium compositions. And uh, quite remarkably, even though we just had those two free parameters, uh, the quality of the fitting curves is actually quite good. And furthermore, uh, what we find um, is, the, uh, is that this spin defacing length, which is represented by the, uh, the vertical uh, dashed line um, exhibits a, a rather systematic trend. So it increases with um, addition of gadolinium, with the addition of gadolinium into the spin sink until you reach the uh, magnetic compensation point. And beyond that, the spin dephasing length decreases again. Uh, in other words, what we're observing here is that the spin dephasing length extracted from this model uh, still exhibits a maximum um, uh, near the magnetic compensation composition. Here's a quick summary of how the spin dephasing length that we extracted from the model uh, evolves with um, uh, composition, gadolinium concentration. And again, what we observe is a maximized spin dephasing length corresponding to um, where the magnetic compensation composition. So this observation is very much consistent with the uh, with this scenario, uh, where we get partial cancellation of spin dephasing uh, that is enabled by um, compensated antifold magnetic order. We can of course also take a look at our other free fit parameter, um, the uh, the prime this. Uh, this thing that is um, uh, proportional to the net amplitude of spin precession. And that quantity shows a minimum uh, near the compensation composition. And again, this is consistent um, with, with a partial cancellation of dephasing, or in this case, I should say precession, um, uh, in this kind of compensated system. So with precession, one way being uh, canceled out by the, um, by the other magnetic sublattice, 
uh, we would expect this quantity, the net amplitude of precession, to also exhibit a minimum near the magnetic compensation point. So I think I'm almost out of my uh, allotted time, uh, but this is kind of the last thing that I would like to show. Uh, so there's something actually a bit subtle that's going on uh, with this particular composition of cobalt gadolinium. Again, this is the one that's, uh, that we think is, uh, I think it's over here. So yes, this is over here. So close to the magnetic compensation point. So without going into a whole lot of uh, gory details here, okay. Um, what we are observing is that um, the net direction or the net spin precession direction just for this particular composition is reversed with respect to what we observe from um, all the rest of cobalt gadolinium alloys. So just to clarify what I'm talking about, well, here's our um, interpretation illustrated. So in almost basically all of these um, um, samples, except for this middle one right here, what's happening is that the net precession direction of the uh, transfer spin is always dictated by uh, whichever magnetic sublattice that is dominating the net magnetization. So for instance, if the net magnetization of the spin sink is dominated by the gadolinium sublattice, the net precession direction of the spin current is really governed by um, the precession about the gadolinium, gadolinium magnetic sublattice. Uh, but just for this particular composition, what we believe is happening is that even though the net magnetization is dominated by the gadolinium sublattice, the uh, net precession direction of um, uh, transverse, the uh, transverse spin current is actually dominated by the other magnetic sublattice, the cobalt sublattice that's pointed in the opposite direction with respect to the net magnetization of the spin set. So we take this to be um, actually evidence that um, the transfer spin current interacts at least somewhat more strongly with the, uh, uh, the more itinerant, delocalized uh, 3D magnetic sublattice of cobalt than the more localized uh, 4F magnetic sublattice of gadolinium. All right, so this is really the end of my presentation. As a quick summary, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, we have found the spin dephasing length, the dephasing length of the uh, transfer spin current is indeed extended in um, nearly compensated ferry magnets. And this scenario is supported very well by our modified uh, drift diffusion modeling incorporating the transmitted spin mixing conductance, uh, which appears to successfully capture the internal physics of dephasing. Um, so to put it in a different way, um, our study indeed validates this hypothesis that a longer transfer spin coherence length is enabled by collinear antiferromagnetic order. And I think this um, introduces a rather interesting fundamental approach or maybe a new, um, new pathway in antiferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, for example, you know, I'd like to conclude my talk by bringing up a couple of open questions, which may be uh, kind of interesting to look at in future endeavors. So one thing to keep in mind is that in our study, the uh, ferry magnets of cobalt gadolinium are amorphous. They're very much structurally disordered. Um, so the question is, um, you know, what is the role of that structural disorder um, in determining the spin dephasing length? So to put it in a different way, can we achieve, can we observe an even longer spin dephasing length in antiferrol magnets that are cleaner, uh, more pristine structure? Um, and the second question down here is uh, a bit more practical in nature. So if we do end up with a, a very long spin dephasing length, what sort of impact does it really have on spin torque effects in both ferrimagnetic and antiferrol magnetic metals that are uh, presumably very useful for uh, practical spintronic applications. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you all for your um, attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sator, for the very nice talk. Um, we can clap by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So it's time for questions. Um, please use the raise hand button uh, you can do that by clicking the participants uh, button and in the pop-up menu uh, at the bottom, there should be a, a raise hand. Um, oh, actually we already have uh, two questions. Uh, 
Jun Jun Wenxu, please go ahead with your question. Please unmute it. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for your nice talk. And uh, in your presentation, you show that you did an experiment on permaloid and a cobalt gadolinium. My question is: In the ferromagnetic resonance, have you seen the second peak of cobalt gadolinium? And what mm -hmm. is the that that peak play the role in your experiment? Okay, so this is a very good question. Um, so when we have cobalt, we can definitely see the second resonance peak. But to answer your question, cobalt gadolinium, we actually do not um, observe any FMR response that we can attribute to the cobalt gadolinium layer. Um, cobalt gadolinium layer, at least within this composition window. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I guess the quick answer is, well, since we don't see it, well, it's not really affecting our results, I suppose. I see. Thank you. Uh, Alexi, please uh, unmute and ask a question. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, so I, I would like to bring to your attention yet another paper on spin mixing transmission. So I can give you a reference through chat. I don't know if you can access it. Uh, so it's paper from 2006. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and I also have a question. Uh, so what about uh, in some cases, we might get boundary magnetization. So what would be uh, the effect of that on such type of phenomena, you think? Okay, so by boundary magnet magnetization, um, are, are you talking about some kind of proximity induced magnetism, uh, for instance? And I mean, for example, if you have antiferromagnet, uh, there might be some uh, magnetization at the interface. Yep. And sometimes it's even... Uh, has to be there by symmetry, right? Uh, for okay. example, for magnetoelectrics, or it can be there by chance. Okay, so we're talking about some kind of uncompensated magnetic order at the interface of an at the interface, yes, and then right. the your spin current has to pass through it. Right. Yeah, that is a really good question, and I'm not sure that I have a straightforward answer. Although in the context of our study. Um, Again, what I want to point out is that the material system that we used, cobalt gadolinium, is, I guess it's not really a, an antiferromagnetic material per se. It's, a, it's an amorphous ferry magnet. Uh, so in general, yeah, I guess we always have, presumably we always have some sort of net magnetization, I guess, everywhere um, throughout our sample. But, um, yeah, so I, I guess if we were to conduct this type of experiment on an actual, you know, real antifill magnet, intrinsic antifill magnet, that's not a fairy magnet. Um, I think, yeah, the, that question that you have raised, probably, you know, I can imagine that might affect spin transport as well. And maybe it's even already playing a role in um, what we observe for all these, you know, uh, commonly use antifill magnets, iridium manganese, platinum manganese um, that I showed very briefly. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't think about that, but maybe it could be some kind of interfacial magnetic moment that's also killing coherence too. Yeah, I'm not sure that I really answered your question. Yes, no, yeah, thank you. Uh, Tom, please unmute and ask a question. Hi, yeah, this is uh, Tom Silva at, at NIST in Boulder. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. This is really a, a quite interesting result. Um, it's, it's exciting. Uh, a couple questions about your FMR rig that you use. Um, would it allow for you, for example, to bring a, uh, a laser beam onto your sample to do uh, heating at the area where the sample's next to the waveguide? Because you, you can shift the compensation point ah. around quite easily with, with temperature, mm -hmm. right? So you could maybe right. drive the 80-20 the composition close to zero magnetization or, mm -hmm. or whatever by, right. yeah. by heating it with a laser. So is that a possibility mm -hmm. in your rig? Yes, um, it's definitely possible in our rig. And in fact, uh, okay, we didn't think about using a laser beam, um, but somewhere in our lab, uh, we have a... Uh, like a little resistive heater that we can attach to the back of our substrate that's placed face down on the coplanar waveguide. So yeah, in principle, it's possible. Um, yeah, I mean, we have been out of the lab for so long and I don't know if it's 
still operational, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a possibility, yes. Yeah, it just seems that that would be one of the really nice degrees of freedom to investigate yeah. since you can, um, since it, like you said, it's an artificial anti-ferromagnet, but you can tune things around with temperature quite nice. Um, the other question is whether you're able to do a, um, a perpendicular biased experiment rather than in-plane biased, because um, there's a certain anisotropy associated with the spin current that you generate with an in-plane bias, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the spin current's perpendicular to the surface and sometimes it's tangential, which can make it fairly complicated. The other thing is you have, um, uh, you can have a, a source of broadening of the line that has to do with dipole-dipole scattering that essentially will mm -hmm. scatter you into degenerate uh, spin wave modes um, when you have an in-plane magnetized system. And while I know you didn't get any FMR signal from, from, from the rare earth transition metal alloy, it could still be a source of dipole fields, uh, random dipole fields that can actually mm -hmm. scatter you into degenerate modes. Mm -hmm. And it, it may very well be the case that for the right composition and the right thickness, you'll maximize the scattering in those modes. Whereas if you're in the perpendicular geometry, the spin wave manifold is such that you no longer have degenerate spin wave modes to scatter into. So mm -hmm. it's a long winded, uh, observation, but then so the main question is, can you do a perpendicular bias experiment to repeat these measurements? Well, unfortunately, not on our rig that's uh, in our own lab. Um, although, yeah, we have some ideas on how to set up such a system, and uh, we do have collaborators who can, uh, yeah, so we, we have one collaborator at least who can probably try this at least to, to some extent. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, same, I, I was going to offer to say that we have it. Oh, again, right. And okay. We'll get back in the lab, but we do have a perpendicular bias FMR rig, so we'd be, be happy to look at that too, oh, if, well, um, right. if you have any trouble on your end. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, let me see. Sorry, how's that? Um, I, I may pronounce your name incorrectly, uh, but uh, Dr. Jackie, please go ahead, unmute, and ask a question. Is my audio okay? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. So I'm a complete novice and a newcomer to the field, so please forgive me if the question is too elementary. No, no um, I had a question about the two open questions that you suggested. Can you kindly go to that slide? Yeah, uh, at the very end. Yes, thank okay. you. So while you're doing that, the okay, question is obvious. Question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, your second open question is of great interest to me as a newcomer. Mm. And I wanted to know whether you in fact have a qualitative hand-waving shoulder kind of an answer or an expectation for mm -hmm. that question. How do you expect the longer lambda DPs to impact the spin torques and phase magnets? Mm -hmm. So I think, okay, so here's my hand wavy take. So my hand wavy take is that, um, so okay, just stepping back a little bit, in conventional ferromagnets, magnets, um, mm -hmm. spin torque effects are essentially interfacial effects, uh, just yep. because spin dephasing just takes place over such a short distance near the interface. So this means that um, if I'm thinking about this correctly, there's always kind of a tech, you know, sort of trade-off, if you will, between the efficiency of spin torque and, um, and the thermal stability of the magnetization or the magnetic information that's being stored. So in other words, if you make a, a ferromagnetic thin film that's ultra thin, your spin torque efficiency might be very high, but you're sacrificing thermal stability of the stored information. Um, but where, where I, you know, if you have a longer spin dephasing wing, um, say in the ferry magnet or anti ferromagnet, magnet, um, you could conceivably make a, um, make a magnetic medium, a storage medium, where that trade-off no longer holds. So you can still get um, maybe rather efficient spin torque taking place in a you know, pretty thick magnetic medium um, that is also thermally stable. 
Thank, thank you. Uh, may I go ahead and ask the second quick question? Sure. Uh, so it appears that at the compensation point, Lambda DP is approximately four times bigger. You know, instead of one, one and a half nanometers, it's more like six nanometers. Mm -hmm. and so uh, it leads to a question. Uh, there are sister families in which it's not just cobalt gadolinium, but cobalt iron gadolinium, tertiary systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we keeping the gadolinium around 25%, but varying the ratio of cobalt and iron and scanning this in that third dimension would A, significantly change lambda DP. I would expect it to. And if you think that is a, an experiment worth pursuing. Um, possibly. Um, so again, uh, you know, the amount of data points or the kind of the resolution and um, composition, I guess we have is it's, it's limited by various experimental considerations. But yeah, I think by say going to a ternary system, yeah, so it might, maybe it gives us another way of conveniently fine tuning that compensation composition. And by doing that, yeah, I can see, I mean, okay, so I guess taking a step back, uh, it's possible that the maximized, the maximum value of spin dephasing length is not, it's not really limited to, you know, five and a half nanometers. Maybe right. it's not just the composition a little bit, maybe it's even higher. Right. So, yeah, it's certainly worth pursuing. Um, but yeah, I think one thing to think about is how, you know, how precisely can we tune the composition and how precisely can we nail down the compensation point? Uh, so that was actually our, one of our technical, one of the technical challenges in our study. Well, thank you. Thank you for the answer. I'm done. Um, okay, uh, Rolando, please unmute and ask a question. Sure, thank you. Uh, I have two questions actually. So the first one is uh, all the data you presented is for metallic ferromagnets. That's right. So yeah. what would change mm -hmm. uh, if they, if all, everything was an insulator? So, uh -huh. so that's my first question. Yeah. The that... second question, mm -hmm. so let, let me just ask uh, the second question, which is related. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened, so I think it's related to the first question of the first person who asked, so your microwave drive is not only driving the ferromagnetic resonance of the material that you that it is driving, it's also driving modes of the spin sink at the same time. So how in your model is that considered? Okay, so in, um, let's see, so which, uh, okay, so let me answer your second question first before, I guess before I forget it. Um, so, so yes, the microwave is driving everything. It's not, it's not localized to that one spin source layer, of course. Um, but what's something to keep in, keep in mind is that, um, you know, even in the case where we did see FMR response from, you know, the spin sink layer, in this case, ferromagnetic cobalt, the resonance conditions are quite separated between the spin source and the spin sink. So when we're pumping spin current from the spin source by means of FMR, um, practically speaking, the only layer that's undergoing FMR is just the spin source. Um, so really in our modeling, we're not taking into account, or we probably don't need to take into account any kind of um, FMR dynamics in the spin sink layer. Um, so I, I hope that satisfactorily answers your second question. Well, but the, the thing is that whenever you drive, especially a metallic ferromagnet at mm -hmm. some frequency, even if it's not at a resonant frequency, mm -hmm. you're still moving electrons that are, you know, speed cool. polarized mostly, right? So that's, that's why it's related to my first question. So what's the difference with an insulator oh, right. when you're mm -hmm. not, you don't have electrons to move around yeah. in the spin sink? Yeah, so okay. So, okay, so I'm kind of jumping back and forth, but your first question, okay, if the, um, so basically you're saying if, you're, if, if our spin sink layer is, instead of being a conductive or metallic um, ferry magnet or anti ferry magnet, what if it were a, an insulating ferry magnetic spin sink? Right. Would be, what would be the trend for transverse to phasing, et cetera? 
Okay, so admittedly, I, it almost feels like this is something I should have thought about, but I have to admit that I have not. But something to keep in mind is, you know, in all these, basically, you know, the assumption behind the model is that the, the these, uh, you know, coherent transfer spin currents are being carried by electrons at the end of the day. Um, so all this dephasing stuff, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's based on the premise that the uh, spin transport is happening by means of electronic spins rather than something like, I don't think there are any magnons involved, for instance. So, yeah, so I, yeah, I guess I'm not really answering your question in a straight way, but. Um, I mean, that would seem that then it's an open question, at least from. Yeah, from it's, yeah it's, I guess it's another, yeah, it's another open question. And I, I think that, I think the physics would be very much different from what we've, uh, what we presented or demonstrated here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric Montoya, please uh, unmute and ask a question. Hey, thanks, Saitura, for the very nice talk. Um, I have more of a, I guess, a comment, a question, and a suggestion. Oh, okay. So, for the comment, you very nicely pointed out that there's this difference between ballistic and uh, um, diffusive type scattering. So when you have this decoherence, this is more of ballistic type scattering, right? Uh, so the decoherence is the electron scattering, so the charge scattering is happening on a larger length scale than the spin dephasing is another way of saying that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so in the case of the, when you have the cobalt that you're pumping into and using as a spin sink, mm -hmm. when it's thicker than say this threshold one nanometer, this is acting as a pretty efficient spin sink. So any spin current going into that cobalt is effectively absorbed. Yes, Whereas sure. with your cobalt gadolinium, you can see that this isn't really quite a spin sink, it's a spin dephaser. So there's a, there's a larger thick, thickness dependence. So, mm -hmm. um, my question is, have you looked at putting the cobalt uh, spin sink on the other side of the uh. um, gadolinium cobalt? And then you should have a dependence. So your, your damping was maximum when you just have the cobalt. Mm -hmm. And then it's minimum with no co cobalt, uh, cobalt gadolinium. Mm -hmm. You'd expect a decrease in damping with the cobalt as increasing thickness of cobalt gadolinium. And without that cobalt, you have that increasing damping that you see. Um, so uh, while your results are very nice, and I, the, I completely agree with the, the qualitative um, results, you can really, uh, by fitting these two types of, uh, these two diffusion equations for basically actually having a sink and not having the sink, uh, you can get much more quantitative uh, evaluation. So have you considered doing that? We actually we have not uh, we haven't we haven't actually thought about making a, you know we haven't thought about adding another layer to the mix but yeah I, I think I think I I think I follow I think I follow your suggestion here or you know I, I think I understand your suggestion here yeah so if we have an extra ferromagnetic spin sink that's absorbing so if I understood your suggestion correctly so the idea is to yeah have, so if, if you look at your graph that's on the screen right now if you yeah. were to plot zero thickness of cobalt gadolinium and then you have the cobalt this is near 0.025 right mm -hmm. so it's going to be higher than the damping here and it has to converge to the thick limit right yeah, so yeah. That mm -hmm. it'll really nail down what's going on in the cobalt gadolinium yeah I see I see what my suggestion is Okay. Yeah. I mean, we'll, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll definitely keep this in mind. Right. Yeah. Yep. But thanks. Very nice talk. Very nice work. Oh, thank okay. you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so there's uh, one more question from uh, Zoom. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, in the cobalt turbium experiment you mentioned earlier, I think that's the uh, Nature Materials paper, the yeah. magnitude of the inverse spin Hall effect seems to be independent of the layer thickness. Also, um, so can you explain that their results? Uh, okay, I, I don't think I'm really in the position to explain other other people's studies, um, but yeah, that that is that is I think an astute observation. Um, where where was it? <laughs> yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it is an astute observation in the sense that yeah, it, it's it is okay. So if there is if the signal is coming from spin transmission through cobalt terbium, 
um, I mean, still, we would expect there to be some amount of decoherence that depends on the cobalt terbium thickness. So, yeah, so I guess it is kind of interesting that um, the signal level appears to stay constant. So, but uh, I, I don't think I'm in the appropriate uh, position to comment on where, you know, what, what really is going on here. Sure. Uh, we have two more questions from uh, Twitch, from a live stream. I'm just going to read them uh, to you. Uh, the first question is, uh, when the FMR spin pumping generated spin current is transmitted into the copper layer, the magnon is already not coherent. Uh, that's uh, K doesn't equal to zero. Uh, what you measured is actually spin diffusion length rather than spin defacing length. Uh, can you please comment on that? Um, okay. Let's see, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm following here. So the, the spin transport, okay, hold on. So I think, you know, kind of based on what I said before, what we're looking at here is, at least the way I'm looking at this is, this, this is not really about magnon transport. Rather, I mean, it's a pure spin current in the sense that there's no net, uh, net charge current, but the spins that are being carried are, are still, you know, they're still being carried by electrons. So electrons spin polarized one way, you know, moving one way and spin polar polarization the other way, moving the other way. So it's a pure spin current carried by electrons. Um, and I guess another thing that, yeah, so one other thing that I would like to point out perhaps is if it were purely what we're observing is purely due to spin diffusion. So, you know, diffusive limit scattering, it's like, sorry, there's just, there are just so many clicks to go through. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to point out is, okay, if the damping enhancement that we're observing here is, you know, solely due to um, scattering spin diffusion, um, this is basically all we're going to get uh, damping. And if I'm understanding the model correctly, Anyway, so what I believe is, you know, th this is this is really what we're what we're stuck with. So the damping enhancement would only monotonically increase with a spin sink thickness. So you know, this um, scattering diffusive, you know, purely diffusive model would not capture any of these strange, um, you know, oscillatory or overshooting features that we see. Um, so, you know, be pre presented between those two scenarios, you know, between uh, scattering and dephasing, yeah, I would, you know, I would say that dephasing is more of a, um, a consistent and probable mechanism. Oh, and yeah, there is one more obvious thing, actually. Hold on. So if what we're seeing was entirely due to um, spin, spin flip, um, you know, um, diffusive scattering, what I would wonder is, okay, what, what, what else can, you know, account for this kind of trend or, or okay, or maybe you don't, if you don't believe our model, uh, you know, what can, you know, really account for the fact that, uh, you know, even the apparent, you know, coherence length, if you will, so the thickness around which the damping enhancement saturates, yeah, it does look like, you know, even just kind of eyeballing, we, we see that it appears to be maximizing use uh, compensation. If it were all due to spin, you know, uh, diffusive scattering, what I would expect is, you know, more some kind of monotonic trend with increasing gadolinium concentration rather than a peak that corresponds to compensation, I guess. And as far as we know, the only thing, kind of the most plausible explanation that this is very much related to the interaction of spin current with the magnetic order, so dephasing. So I don't know, hopefully that answered, uh, that addressed that question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, for, for people on the Twitch, if they, if you're not satisfied with the answer, you can follow up with uh, uh, just email the speaker. Um, so the second question on Twitch is, uh, why is the defacing length of cobalt gadolinium shorter than the cobalt terbium? Is that's comparing? Uh, yeah, the, that's, the yeah. So, I mean, you could interpret that in many different ways. So one thing that we really 
should do at some point is to carry out the same type of experiment, right? The same experimental technique, you know, looking at damping enhancement with cobalt terbium as the spin sink material. Um, we, we have yet to do that. So that would, that would, prop, that would likely provide a more, um, uh, I guess, viable answer. Um, at this point, all I can, probably the responsible for thing for me to say is, I, I don't really know why there is a discrepancy. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll have one more question. Uh, Li Junju, please uh, uh, unmute and ask us a question. Uh, hi. Yep, hello there. Hi, uh, very nice talk. So I haven't understand why a long spin defacing lens is a good thing. For example, I would think in a spin talk process, the thickness of the magnetic layer will not influence the torque efficiency. As soon as the uh, magnetic layer is thicker, that is defa defacing lens. Uh, <clears throat> this is because uh, the whole magnetic layer are actually coupled, so it that doesn't matter for exert, uh, for exert of torque or absorption mm -hmm. of the spin current. Mm -hmm. Instead, if the spin defacing spin defacing lens is very long. Uh, actually, uh, you will, you will, you will, uh, the efficiency of spin absorption will be low. So let's mm. say if your spin defacing is infinity, you will never get a, a effective torque because the angular momentum is still carried by electrons and it's not transferred to the magnetic system. Okay, yeah, I uh, think. I see. That. Right, yeah, I think I see where you're going with this. Yeah, I think. What I got out of your question is that, yeah, um, suppose for a second that spin defacing length is uh, infinity, then um, yeah, it might appear as if, it, it might seem like we are just never getting the spin torque effect, at least in the conventional sense. Right. Right. Um, so that, oh, right. So let, let me point out one thing though. So this is something that's not quite intuitive to me yet, but, um, Oh, shoot. So in one of the references that I cited, so a paper by, uh, I think, um, Paul Haney, Alan MacDonald, uh, those people were um, mm -hmm. their, their first author's name, I think, was Nunes from 2006. Um, they do talk about kind of the extreme case where um, the injected spin, spin current does stay coherent throughout the bulk of some simple antiferrule magnet. Mm -hmm. so, Essentially, uh, what they have is a, a spin defacing length of infinity. Um, but what they show is that there still is a torque that, um, and this is something that I don't quite understand. I don't quite understand how this works here. But apparently, there is a torque that is. Um, there's something qualitatively different about the torque that arises in such an antiferrule magnet where the coherence is infinite. Um, so I'm probably not answering your question all that well, but there is a paper that does say that, you know, uh, from the quantum mechanical point of view, there still does arise a, um, a finite and I think surprisingly efficient torque, even when the spin defacing length is infinity. But yeah, yeah that's, that's I know how to reconcile the picture that you presented and, um, and the picture that's proposed in this 2006 paper. Yeah, because some some studies show that if uh, the, the thickness of the magnetic layer is is uh, smaller than its uh, defacing lens, then the spin current cannot be entirely absorbed, and it can refer back from the top right. surface and cancel the torque. Yeah. So that yeah. actually says yeah, looks like the bad thing. It could be That's a bad I mean, this is this is for a, a, a magnetic medium with fixed thickness. Um, right. I suppose you could always make the medium thicker, um, and that kind of goes back to what I mentioned briefly about okay, if you have a thick medium and you can still get away with having uh, rather efficient spin torque, then um, you know maybe technologically that could be a good thing. Yeah, but then you need not energy. Yeah, you needed to overcome that energy in order to write this uh, mm -hmm. in the mid. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I need to think about this a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, do I have uh, uh, more questions? All right, if there's no other, uh, oh, there's actually. Um, so I do get a, one more question uh, asking whether we have look at whether you look at the temperature dependence, but I think that's asked by uh, Dr. Tom yeah, Silva yes, earlier. Uh, yeah, the short question, the, the short answer at this point is yeah, not 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 quite yet, but it it would be a good idea. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, Kiro has one question. Please go ahead and ask that. Yes. Thank you very much for for this very interesting talk. Um, so I, I'd like to touch upon something you um, you mentioned already close to the end that um, you have this uh, retrograde precession oh, yes uh -huh. at, at a concentration so generally speaking um, I think there is no reason that the magnetic compensation point where the magnetization goes to zero is a compensation point for anything else I mean presumably what is relevant here is something like the uh, exchange splitting at the Fermi level for the, yeah. for the conduction electrons. And in general, there is no reason it goes to zero at the same point where the magnetization goes to zero. Yeah. Yeah. It That's can right. even be K dependent, which means you would never have infinite uh, dephasing length mm -hmm. because you, you, you can have electrons with different K vectors still dephase with, with different rates. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that can be checked in the first principles calculation. So where exactly the average um, exchange splitting goes to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. So do you have an indication that this compensation point is supposed to be at least close to the magnetic compensation point? Uh, okay, so now you touch up, yeah, I was wondering when somebody might uh, ask this kind of question. Um, right, so there are, there are certain things that are that I think kind of um, introduce some ambiguities to this aspect of the study. Uh, so one thing is that experimentally, we don't. First of all, we don't exactly know uh, where the magnetic compensation point is. And to make the matter, you know, even somewhat more complicated, um, the magnetic compensation composition actually, um, as, at least as far as we can tell from magnetometry. Uh, seems to shift slightly, or at least by some amount, with thickness. So this is why we have uh, this sort of fuzzy shaded area. So we didn't we didn't nail down the magnetic compensation composition. It's it's more of a, a fuzzy window. Um, yeah, and second thing, yes, maybe it's not quite related to the point that you have raised, but something that I have been asked multiple times by different people is, you know, does this maximization of dephasing length happens at magnetic compensation or angular momentum compensation. Uh, we don't know because, well, those two compositions, at least for this material, are really close uh, to the point that it's kind of within our, you know, experimental imprecision uh, and experimental uncertainty. I don't think angular momentum is even relevant. It's mm. It's the exchange coupling that has to be compensated. Exchange, right, yeah. And it, 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 it actually may be close because, I mean, if we just look at what we know for um, um, rare earths, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the FD coupling is uh, maybe 0.15 electron volts. So mm -hmm. gadolinium has a um, seven Bohr magneton. So the, the splitting would be something like one uh, electron volt. Mm -hmm. um, if you just have pure gadolinium, maybe somewhat less, maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Mm -hmm. So in cobalt, the, the exchange coupling is on the order of one EV. So it looks like it's kind of in the same range, but it depends on what exactly the, the magnetic moment uh, is on cobalt um, and which electrons are at the Fermi level. The, the, this could be found in the first principles calculation, mm -hmm. at least in a crystal. I mean, here it's amorphous. Yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately, uh, this is an amorphous alloy. Um, but yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, we can somehow come up with a crystalline equivalent to this material. Yeah. Maybe it's more amenable to, yeah, uh, comparison with first principles calculations. Right. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have other question here? 
Okay, if there's no other question, I want to thank the speaker again, and I want to thank all of you for participating.